All right, everyone. I am here with Grant Kirkhope, a uh, composer of Banjo Kazooie, Viva Pinata, Kingdoms of Amalur. So many different games out there. <laughs> um, I just want to say, first of all, Grant, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for asking me. Yeah, no problem. Um, so just to kind of give people out there a sort of background, how did you start your career as a composer? How did you get started? So it was a complete fluke. I didn't, I never once, ever once thought about being a composer ever. <laughs> um, I play. I went through school like you know, like you do. I, I did a music degree at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester, four year thing so as a trumpet player, so a classically trained trumpet player. And I'm a self-taught kind of rock metal guitar player from like age of 12. Um, so I never really wanted to be a trumpet player really, but I was good at it, so I did it. It was four years without getting a job, right? So I thought, you know, it's an extra four years to, to mess around. So I left university in 1984, and I spent the next 11 years really playing in lots of different bands, some rock bands, some kind of soul funk bands on trumpets, some on guitar. Some of the bands did well, some of the bands did terribly. Uh, and through the course of that, um, I met a friend of a guy called Robin Beanland, who was a, a guy in my local area in North Yorkshire, in, in North of England. Uh, yeah. He played in one of the bands that I played for, we, were, we became friends. He was a keyboard player. And he one day he announced he got a job. And I was like, what? Like, no one that I knew got a job. Most people that I knew just played in bands and signed on unempl unemployment insurance benefit, you know, when they, when they could. That's what I did for like 11 years. Um, you know, some local bands playing pub rock, that kind of stuff. I was like, wow. So yeah, I'm going to go work at a company called Rare and write music for video games. I was like, Is that, what? That's a job. I didn't really, I never thought about it. <laughs> so, um, um, but when I was at college, you have to pass the harmony exam, right? Like once in the four years that you're there. And I failed it three years out of four because I'm terrible at harmony. Um, so I never once thought about being a composer. Like I, did, I did write songs for the metal bands that I played for. But, you know, composing was like, never thought about it. So you you've, been at rare, you've been at Rare about a year and a half. I said to me, no, Grant, you've been on and off on employment benefit for like 11 years. Don't you think it's time you got a job? You know, I was living on <laughs> my, my mother still at 33, uh, or 32. Um, and I said, well, you know, what can I do? He said, well, why, why don't you try to write music video games look like I'm doing? And I, you know, I, I played a lot of games at the time. So I thought, well, I could, I could give it a try, I suppose. So um, he recommended I buy an Atari ST computer, a copy of Cubase, um, a synthesizer to work with. And I spent the kind of 1994 writing music that I thought was appropriate for video games. And I sent Rare uh, five cassette tapes over the course of that year. I never got a reply. And out the blue, I got a letter saying, please come for an interview. I couldn't believe it. So um, it was about 100 miles away. So I, you know, I got in my car and drove down for an interview. And Dave Wise actually interviewed me with Simon Farmer, who was the general manager at the time at Rare, on a Friday. And on Monday, I got a letter saying you got the job. Couldn't believe it. So I packed my bags, left, left my mother, and went to, went to live down in, uh, near Rare and started in October, October 15th, 1995. So it was a complete fluke. I never once thought about being a composer. If Robin hadn't done it, I've never done it. It was just, it's all down to him, really. And you, so you met both Robin Beanland and David Wise through that entire process. Well, I knew Robin Beanland from, for quite a while because he was in the local area, played local bands together. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, I knew him already as a, as a friend, but I met, I met Dave at the interview. That's the first time I met him. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy how things work out like that, huh? Yeah. I mean, like Robin, <laughs> if Robin, Robin never done it, I've never done it myself. I never once thought about it. <laughs> Um, so kind of jumping from the past to the present here, um, I, I believe on YouTube, you can find like the, the making of the soundtrack of Mario plus Rabbids. You could see like they're doing a live performance. Have you, have you ever conducted the orchestra yourself or do you, do you just kind of leave that to the, uh, the other people at like Ubisoft or whoever to do that? Well, I usually hire a composer, uh, sorry, a conductor to do the conducting part. Because I always think when you're in the studio, um, you want to make sure it's right. So I don't want to get too caught up in the con conducting it and not hear, listen to it properly. So I feel like I feel like if someone else is conducting it, I'm in, I'm in the booth, listen to the music, listen to what's going on. And I can sort of say, you know, bar four, bar ten, correct that, correct that, whatever. So I feel like that's better. The only, the only con conducting that I've done in in umpteen years is I did that um, Ubisoft E3 press conference a couple of years ago, where we unveiled the Donkey Kong add-on to DLC to the Mario Rabbids game. And I conducted Critical Hit, who's that game, that, that, that little group of people that Jason Hayes from, from Blizzard put together. So I did that. That's the last time I conducted it. That's the first time I conducted in ages, actually, but that's the last time I did it. 
I think I, while I was doing research for this interview, I actually saw that press conference for the first time and I was like, oh, I didn't even know he did that. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and kind of the last bit for like general introductory stuff. Um, you did a bit of voice work during the Nintendo 64 era. You know, you did uh, Donkey Kong and uh, uh, some of the names are slipping my mind right now, but do you still do that nowadays or is that just kind of a thing of the past now? I only really do music now. I don't do, do it any, more, any sound effects at all. Oh. Like I only really did voice acting back at Rare because, because no one else wanted to do it. And it was just quick. So, you know, I never really thought about it. And it's funny now that I was the voice of DK for a little while and it's a bit weird that it kind of worked out that way. But I only really did it because it was quick. I was in my office, just quickly got a mic up, made a few noises and just stuck it in the game. It was just fast, right? Like same with the voices of Banjo, Banjo Kazoo or Viva Pinata or any of the stuff that I've done. It was just because it was quick. I didn't have to bother anybody else. So I just did it. It wasn't like a, a choice. So it's, it was, as I say, it's bizarre that I ended up being DK for a little while. It's quite, it's quite, you know, weird. <laughs> I was going to say with, with some of the stuff you've done, like mumbo jumbo, again, Donkey Kong, the sounds are so simple. It makes sense. It kind of, kind of makes you wonder why no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> it yeah. It kind of changed later when it, when it got to Viva Pinata and we do all the, the animals because it's like, like, you know, 65, 70 animals in the first game. Right. Um, I used I started asking the dev team if wanted to do it and everyone's a bit reluctant. But once it started to do it, they all really enjoyed it. So I used to I used to send an email out saying I've got an animal. I used to wait for the first reply and that, that person got chosen to do the voice. So it's so like um people really enjoyed it in the end. And like lots of the guys contributed to Viva Pinata. Steve Mills had loads of voices, Ed Bryan. Um, you know, so uh yeah, it got to the point that everybody everybody started to want to do it. But at the start, no one did. So I just did it to be quick. Fair enough. Um Kind of jumping, well, back, forward, I don't know how you want to put it, but kind of to the Nintendo 64 era of stuff, kind of sticking in that territory. Um, kind of a general question in, in that regard. What was the composition process like back then? So the actual process of writing music hasn't changed for me at all. I, I write music the same I did then as I did now. I just kind of load up a sample on the, on, on the computer, mess around with it on the keyboard until I hear something that I like. But the actual putting the music into the machine, that's way different, you know. Right. Like you, had, you had to put, like, you had to make, you had to make your own, your own little MIDI sound setup of like instruments you wanted to use, and that yes. would sit inside the N64. And then we we, we would plug up our PCs would would link to the N64, so we could actually play the sounds in the N64, rather than like writing music at full quality and then try to make it sound good. We played the actual sounds that we'd made in the machine, so you only really use the sounds that sounded good in certain bits. So I think that's why rare music was was good in those days because we only we, we got used to using the sounds in the machine as opposed to writing something very elaborate that wouldn't transfer so right. um so that's the way it worked so um um you just had to get your little midi sound set put together stick it in the in the machine and that's that, that and do your best you know because uh, memory was so tight um so you know that's just something you got used to that's just the way it was right um i, I do feel sometimes Having those limitations made you be a bit more creative. Yeah. Um, I do feel it, like, especially when I did the Game Boy, first of all, even with that, you do find yourself, I don't like the phrase thinking outside the box, but I, you were <laughs> doing that. Um, <laughs> you had to sort of, you know, think, how can you make this 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 little sound set of things that didn't sound very good, sound good, it, all, all together in a, in a piece of music, you know, like with Golden Eye, whatever. So, um, yeah, you know, it's different now. We just write big, full quality stereo waves down, send them off, and that's what gets into the game. Now, they still, they still are compressed, but it's not like playing a little MIDI sound set like we had back then. And spe speaking of GoldenEye, um, how easy was it for Rare to get the rights to the, the, to the James Bond theme, you know, Monty Norman's tune? How easy was it to get their hands on that? That was just all part of the deal. So they, when, 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 when Eon, you know, Eon owned everything that's Bond, when, um, Dre got the license. It was all part and parcel, so we could use it as much as we wanted to. There was no no question about it. Because no. I know Monty Norman is is very litigious. He, he he does anybody goes near it, he sues them to death. But I mean, I know Monty Norman got a lot of money uh, for the Golden Eye from Golden Eye cartridges, and I, I I do know what he got, and it's a lot of money. <laughs> so I, I don't think he'd be too, too unhappy about the way we did it. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I actually talked about a different James Bond game on my show 
last episode, we talked about the world's not enough. And I mentioned the fact that they didn't have the Monty Norman theme in it at all, at least to my memory. So it was, it was kind of an interesting comparison between GoldenEye and uh, the world's not enough. But then again, they were made by different companies. So yeah, I, I, you just, you cannot do Bond without the Bond theme. It just isn't, it's just not worth it. You have to, right. have that. like, I'm not convinced. I don't know how many of the Bond games got, had losses to the music, to the theme. I know we did. I don't know how many of the other guys that did it after us did. Um, so, but you know, I, I, you, you, just, you, you can't do that, that, bond, that Monty Norman's theme. It's not possible. Right. It's just, it's just not possible. Um, I mentioned uh, on my show, I talked about Agent Under Fire and Nightfire, I believe. They were two Bond games around the PlayStation 2 GameCube era. They had the Monty Norman theme. But I can't think of any others beyond that because I, I haven't played any of the ones that ha- use a Daniel Craig's likeness. Right. I, I'm not sure if those use the Monty Norman theme, but I do know the ones back from like the PS2 GameCube era, those use the, the original tune. Yeah, you've got to have it. It's, it's, it's just not right without it. Right. It's, it just doesn't have that Bond charm to it. No, no. <laughs> Um, and kind of jumping ship from GoldenEye to its, I call it its cousin, Perfect Dark. Um, I know, oh, what's his name? Grayman Norgate, I believe his name is. He handled a large chunk of the soundtrack. But the composition process for Perfect Dark, was that kind of the same as GoldenEye, given the same kind of spy and stealth motifs? Or was there a bit of a different process to Perfect Dark's composition? Yeah, so Graham didn't do a lot on Gold, on Perfect Dark um, because he'd left Rare by that point. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so he did a couple of tunes, I think, just kind of held over, but I think most of it's by me and Dave Klinick. Uh, did oh, that. okay. Yeah, so I, did, I think I did most of the levels, I think, and Dave Klinick did, did, did the, the um, uh, cut scenes because he just started at Rare just as I was getting started with Perfect Dark because Graham had just left um, to go work at Free Radical and do Time Splitters. And so, um, yeah, so, yeah, Graham did do a lot on Perfect Dark. I mean, I think uh, maybe one or two, I think. I'll have to look it up. It's not very many. But on GoldenEye, we, I think we did probably half and half on GoldenEye. Um, but, yeah, so it was mainly me and Dave Clinic on Perfect Dark. The same thing with that. I was, you know, I was trying to write some kind of secret agent-y, futuristic, x files thing, Blade runner That was sort of going through my head when I was writing it, you know. So, you know, you just, you, you pull influences from, you know, at the time, x files was massive, and I kind of had that in my head, I suppose. Um, but you know, I loved Doom Perfect Dark. It was a great soundtrack to do. It was you know, it was, I got to write some quite dark, stealthy music and um, electronic stuff and synthy stuff. You know, so I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah. Um, one thing I I really enjoyed about the Perfect Dark soundtrack was the more synthetic feel to it because not a lot of games on the N sixty four really did that at the time. They, uh, I don't know how I want to describe earlier N sixty four games, but they didn't really have the the sort of synthetic futuristic feel that perfect dark had. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was just, you know, I, I, you shut your eyes and imagine, don't you? So you just tell a story. So I shut my eyes and heard that noise. And like, it was all that blade runner X files mixed together with a bit of me in it as well, probably. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I was thinking of, you know? Yeah. Um, and kind of jumping ship from the shooter sort of genre to um, arguably what you're better known for is uh, platformers, uh, Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, you know. Um, so back when Banjo-Kazooie, I've, I've mentioned on my show how it's notorious for its development process, how it started as a RPG on the SNES, trans- transformed into a 2.5D platformer, and then into what we know now. But in regards of the music for Banjo-Kazooie, as the development process was coming along, as it was changing genres. Um, what was the transition kind of between RPG to 2D or 2D platformer to 3D platformer like? Yeah, so the music I had sort of lasted through the, the RPG and the 2.5D, it kind of lasted through that. And I've written, I wrote, I wrote 107 pieces for uh, Dream. And really? Then just, and then I just threw them all away, really. They all got, they all got thrown away and started afresh when it switched to, band to, to a full-on platformer. Um, so some of the music got used later in other games, I think a little bit, but still a ton of it didn't get used at all. 
it just didn't fit. So when it changed to Banjo Kazooie, before I just I remember Tim Stamper and Greg Mayles you know, came to see me and said you need to change it to it used to be a platform and now like Mario or whatever it used to be you know happy jolly tunes. So I was I just tried I wrote a piece that I thought would just on spec not for anything particular. Um, that I thought would be a platformy jolly tune. And it was actually uh, Click Clock Woods. And it, well, it wasn't called that then. It was a spring version of that, of that. So I wrote that and said, you know, this is what I think a platformer would sound like. They said, oh, you will like it. So so it kind of, so I kept, I kept that piece and never really used it until, it until it came to Click Clock Woods. And I thought that piece sort of suits the level. So it became Click Clock Woods. It wasn't at the start. It was just a kind of general platform test piece to get the game started. And did you write the other versions of Click Lock Wood, like the summer, autumn, and winter versions? Did those come later then? Yeah, they came when it came to the level. So I knew oh, the level. Okay. I just thought that piece fitted the spring area. And then I thought it would be nice to use the same tune for the other areas, but just change it so it sounds summery or wintry or, or autumn, autumnal, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that worked out really well. Um, yeah, no, look it, yeah. <laughs> um, and kind of jumping to the sequel, Banjo-Tooie, um, were there any tidbits from Banjo-Kazooie that you were actually able to reuse or rework for the sequel? So Mayhem Temple was originally in Banjo-Kazooie. Oh. So written, yeah, it was called, I thought it wasn't called that. It was, just, it was like a general sort of, um, you know, that area. So I'd written that piece before, but because it got, it got taken out of, the, out of the first game and put in the second game. Um, um, so you know, I repurposed it for that, so it kind of fitted them, and that's why I have, that's what, that mumbo speak that's that come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. That that thing that mumbo chants. So that yeah. chant, I'd, I'd had that chant was in the piece. It was in the piece of music. In, in the piece, you can hear it in the background going, "Come on, up I go." If you, like, you know what I mean? It sounds like that. Yeah. So, so I had those voice samples in Banta Kazooie, even <laughs> though I knew the, the the piece wasn't going to be used in the game. So when it came to mumbo talking, I thought, I've already got these samples in the game. I'll just repurpose them for Mumbo's voice. So when Mumbo speaks, it just plays those samples in a random order. You know, that's what, you know, that, you know, that's where Ekan Bokum comes from. If you kind of rearrange the voice samples. Yeah. You can, it gets Ekan, it isn't really Ekan Bokum, it's like Ekan, I don't know, so what it, I, I, I cut it into like really short phrases. So it was like, come on, up, up, go, if you think go, ah, e, uh, like that. I yeah. Cut it up. So you can make Ekan Bokum out of those samples. I can't remember the order, but you can make it out of that. So. Yeah, so those samples were there, were in the game for that piece of music because the piece got put into Tui. I just kept the, the, the voice samples and used them for his voice. That actually reminds me of something. Speaking of Mumbo and Maya Hem Temple, the whole come and have a go if you think you're hard enough thing. Where, how did that come about? Was it just kind of a, a random sentence you came up with or was that like an inside joke at Rare? Or how did that well, come about? Me and Greg Mills, the game director, it was a kind of at football matches, soccer matches in the UK, when you get these angry fans who want to fight each other, they'd often go, come on, have a go, if you think you're hard, they chant it, come on, have a go, if you think you're hard enough to have a fight. Right? <laughs> so I don't know why we thought that was a funny idea, but I kind of, I, I came up with it and Greg said, yeah, this no one's going to know why they really. So this, and, and not, people didn't really notice that that's what I was saying in the background until I, until I told people, they didn't did spot it. So um, <laughs> yes, that was just one of those weird things. It's just kind of soccer chant when people want to have a fight, you know. Uh, it's not very nice, really, but I just thought it was funny. <laughs> that is that is funny because, honestly, I, I can't think of us having anything like that over here in America. Like, whenever I see a football game, like, yeah, we have people in, like, face paint and all that, but I don't think we have, like, a sort of fighting phrase or yeah. whatever you would want to refer that as. There was a lot of time in the UK where, where the kind of soccer violence got quite bad. There was like proper gangs in each of the clubs and then arranged to meet up, meet up and have fights. It did get pretty serious for a while. I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. Um, but back in the maybe 80s, 70s, 80s, I suppose, I think it got it got to quite bad. Yeah, I I don't know a whole lot about like the UK's culture or like how I know soccer's huge over there. I know right. they call it football over there, but yeah. that's that's the extent of my knowledge. So that's <laughs> it's interesting to me. Um, and kind of jumping from Banjo over to Donkey Kong, I know, obviously we talked about how you did the voice of Donkey Kong, but the DK rap, who, how did that come about? Um, I know 
like when I, whenever I see someone mention the DK rap on Twitter, you think, oh, it'll never die or, <laughs> but it, it just strikes me. It strikes my curiosity. How did the idea for the DK rap come about? <laughs> So I feel like you know it was DK was coming back after being a, a, a new a new a brand new three D three D DK. So George Andreas, who was the, their game director, um, who was a he was a, he was an assistant designer on Banjo Kazooie. He went to, went to went to lead the Donkey Kong Country to, Don, Donkey Kong sixty four team. I wanted to try and do something that kind of meant DK is coming coming he's coming to the future. You know he's, he's he's coming he's coming afresh. He's like a new three D character. It's a new thing, right? First three D game. At the time, you know, rap music was very big. I mean, it's gigantic now, but, you know, it's kind of, I guess it was early days of rap back yeah. then. Um, so George said, let's have a rap, you know. I was like, all right, you know, I don't know if I can manage that. <laughs> so uh, George wrote, wrote the lyrics and I had to produce the rest of it and put it all together and all that. And he, he, just, he just kind of wrote a rhyme out, and you know, that, like that. And he kind of had this idea of, um, um, I think there was a track at the time, Run DMC, Jason Nevins, that I tracked together called It's, it's Like That, That's The Way It Is. Uh, and he wanted quite a fast rap. And I said, oh, no, I don't want that. And I found this drum loop on my synthesizer. It just goes, dook, 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 dook. <laughs> I said, I like that. I think it's that, it's that kind of drum beat for that funky called Medina track. I don't know who does that, but that, it's a bit like that. So I like that. So look, 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 I'll do it. You forget it. Give me these lyrics. I'll sort it out. So uh, so I put it all together. And, and I got George Andreas and, the, and Chris Sutherland did the, did the voices for Banjo and Kazooie and tons of other stuff. At I use a lead program on the Banjo team uh, to do the rapping. And I got the Banjo team guys to do the chorus, the D, K, don't, that's like Greg Mayles, Steve Mayles, Chris Peel, Ed Bryan, um, a lot of the Banjo team just came in and did that bit. So I thought it was hilarious. I thought, yeah, I thought it was really funny. We all thought it was a great <laughs> thing. It, it brought DK into the 90s, whatever, or the 2000s, you know, brings back, back, back up to date. So I thought, it's just going to be great. People are going to love it, you know. But of course, when it came out, no one really liked it. They all thought it was really <laughs> terrible. So I think they all, they all thought that I was trying to make some kind of credible rap track. But I was just trying to make a funny, jokey rap track. I wasn't trying to be like Ice-T or whoever was big at the time. I don't know who it was. Um, <laughs> you know, so, um, so I kind of got a bit of a slate in for that at the time. But it was funny because I feel like Donkey, the DK rap's kind of gone, it's sort of got its own little niche in history now. Like people sort of quite like it and I think it's funny. And the, I think the little, the little kids who played the games, back then thought it was funny it was, it was the older kids the teenagers that, that, were, that were hip and cool yeah didn't like it because it, it's awful right i know i know it's awful <laughs> um, you know, so uh, so it's funny that um I, I think everybody sort of likes it now and t- knows it's tongue-in-cheek and it's a bit, of a bit of a laugh and you know so it's, it, i think it's taken 20 years for people to like it but i'm glad they liked it in the end you know yeah um i'm one of those people that's like it's kind of cheesy but yeah. that's what makes it good it's like it's a pro- it's a product of its time, really. <laughs> um, I feel like for all the music that I've written since, I've been known for the DK rap. Doesn't matter what else I write. That's <laughs> going to be on my tombstone. Here lies Grant Kirkup. He wrote the DK rap. Everything else is. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. I lost my train of thought. I apologize, but um, uh, kind of jumping from. The N64 era up to the Xbox. Now, I I haven't played as many Xbox games as I have N64 games, so most of these questions will be based on my experience with Nuts and Bolts, or Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. So with Nuts and Bolts, that was your last game at Rare, right? Right. And how, that must have been kind of like an emotional, emotional blow because Banjo was kind of a household name at the time considering the success of kazooie and tui and considering this was your last uh banjo game at rare that must have kind of hit hard you know i never thought i'd ever want to leave rare i love being there at rare i kind of feel like i feel like that golden that golden time that rare was you know from like 90 you know from like dkc on the snares up until uh, you know the dk the, the n64 days i feel like rare was just an absolute unbelievable place for making fantastic games yeah and i love being there it was a, it was a family-run company all the stampers ran it um and it was so really good to the staff and it just uh, you know for me it was like after being on the dole of, on the unemployment for like 11 years to get a job at 30 my first job at 33 is pretty late in life right so i was just so grateful to be there and i, I just thought how on earth have i got a job writing music just, it was so fantastic so i never thought i'd ever want to leave rare um it was i just thought i'd be there till i was 
till I died, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, so it was kind of sad that I decided that it wasn't right for me anymore. Um, uh, so the last two games I did was Viva Pinata, Trouble in Paradise and Nuts and Balls. So we kind of, they kind of ran concurrently for the, as we did it. Um, and I, I did two orchestral recording sessions in that last year, 2008, must have been. Uh, for, I did like the Pinata game early on, like maybe February, March, and then we went back to Prague in like June, I think, to do Nuts and Bolts recordings. Um, so it was super sad for me. It was, you know, because I, I, I had a, such a fantastic time where I loved being there so much, and it was sad that I thought I'm leaving them. I'm not going to be here anymore. Uh, so it was. It was very traumatic, and you know, uh, it, it was a, you know, I just didn't want to be there. So um, it was sad, totally sad. Yeah. Um, and. Uh... Kind of following the theme of Banjo's weird development processes, um, when Nuts and Bolts was still a remake of the first game, but with cars, essentially, did you get any other tunes arranged outside of Mumbo's Mountain, or was it just Spiral Mountain and Mumbo's Mountain? So the original thought on redoing Banjo was to redo the first game but as a co-op. So retexture it all, bring it up to date, make it a complete, a complete remaster, do it as a four-player co-op. That was the that was the idea, and we sort of said some of the senior members of the team. I guess I was one of them. So I said, you know, it's going to take as long to retexture the old game as it is to make a new one. It's not going to be. It's no. It's no quicker. So why did we make a new game? At that time, Rare had bought the Havoc engine, the physics engine, and um, that was the first time Rare had actually bought an engine. Rare always did their own engines. With every team did their own, own engine. In fact, um, and there's a there's a kind of demo in it at the start. You're knocking blocks together. Uh, and it kind of showed how the physics worked and all that in, on, on, the, on the game. And that sort of sparked the designers thinking about building things out of cubes and doing all that kind of thing, make, make, building it up. And that's what got, that's what started Nuts and Bolts off by making vehicles. If you think about it, Nuts and Bolts really is, it's a kind of precursor to Minecraft in a way, because like you could build things out of just blocks, you know, but that, that was, you know, that was pretty, pretty new for the time, you know? Yeah. The thing about Nuts and Bolts that kind of let it down was that it wasn't a banjo. It should have been a game on its own without Banjo and Kazooie. People didn't, didn't expect Banjo Kazooie to be, to be in a game like that. If it had been new characters, I think it would have been a lot different. People would have thought different about it because the, the Banjo fans, A, didn't like the fact that Rare had sold themselves to, to Microsoft. They didn't like that. It was all Nintendo people. And yeah. B, they wanted the platform. They, didn't want, they wanted Banjo 3. They didn't want, you know, um, some new game that, that they didn't get. They didn't think suited the character. So it's a bit unfortunate. It's funny because my son, he, he's born in 2002, so he's like six, seven, eight at the time. I mean, moved to America in 2008 to Baltimore. Like whenever his friends came around to the house, that's the game they wanted to play. They loved Nuts and Bolts because they, they, never, they never played Kazooie or Tui. They had no idea who the characters were. And that's just, they just loved building vehicles, crashing, driving them around, building crazy things. That's, they loved it really to death, you know. Um, so I feel like the game is a good game. It just shouldn't have been Banjo Kazooie, really. Um, and Max, I didn't really push it, um, you know, so it kind of got a, bit, a little bit overlooked. It's a bit of a shame, really. Um, but um, yeah, so, so I only really wrote those two kind of complete redos of the pieces that you talked about. But I did do that, that, that Banjo Land level where I stuck together lots and lots of Banjo Kazumi tunes. And it was, it was a kind of, that level was like a, as you ran around the level, you, you would see different bits of, of the old games all stuck together in that level. So I was, I was, I was trying. So I just picked out lots of different tunes and put them, made like a seven-minute piece of music that was um, lots of the old pieces stuck together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was a that was a you know, the kind of. But also in lots of other pieces, there's little homages to the old game. The little like the end of um, Nutty Acres has a little reference to I think just to Treasure Trove Cove in it. There's lots of little bits all over the soundtrack that kind of reference the old games. You know. Yeah, and um, I was going to mention another example in that uh, Showdown Town has the little bit of Jinjo Village in it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I made a point to say, because Robin Beanland and Dave Clinic helped me out in that game too, because I, I ran out of time. My plan was to do that whole, whole game by myself, just like, I, just like I did the other two games. But I was getting close to leaving Rare. I left in July of 2008. Um, so um, uh, I didn't have time to finish it, so they came in and helped out with that. And uh, speaking of Banjo Land, you mentioned that that was the perfect segue into my next question. Uh, how did you decide 
which tunes to include in the melody or was it kind of random? Yeah, just random. I was just, as I went along, I thought this fits, this, this, this fits to that, that'll fit there. I just did it like that. There's no, wasn't any thought in it. I just kind of picked out maybe the best known ones maybe, but I just, ones that fit together well, I just took together. That's fair. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought again, but anyways. Um, and then just kind of after Nuts and Bolts and Viva Pinata, what was your career like after leaving Rare? What was the process like? So I went to I went to work at Big Huge Games in Baltimore to work on Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. So I spent four years there doing that. And that was like, I really enjoyed that. Like it was a very big game that was, it was like a very gigantic thing. And I got to write some very big music. It's the first time I've written anything of that scale before. So I wanted to try to prove to myself that I could write something of that scale, like kind of Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, bigness, you know. So um, yes, I worked really hard on that soundtrack. I was the audio director at that company, actually. Um, so I was, you know, spent four years doing that. Um, went back to Prague and recorded it there again. Um, you know, that soundtrack got a lot of favorable, you know, reviews. So I, I felt like I'd, I'd, I felt like I'd, I'd managed to do something that I thought maybe I couldn't do. Yeah, I didn't know I could write something of that scale before. So it was good to kind of push myself. And I worked, you know, I worked really hard on that game. I like, worked really, on the boss battles. They are big, gigantic orchestral pieces. Um, and I was, listen, I was listening to the Harry Potter soundtracks, the first three by John Williams in the cart on the way to work every day and back for literally four years. I, was, I listened to that and not only that for four years. I know it sounds daft, but that's what I did. I wanted to try and learn what John Williams, the way that John Williams writes music. I mean, not saying I did it, but I tried. Um, and so, um, yeah, I kind of, I was happy that I was happy with myself that I thought I managed to do what I thought I couldn't on that score. And um, I was actually going to mention the fact that I'm I'm actually still playing through Kingdoms of Amalur, the or, the original Reckoning, not the remastered right. re Reckoning version. I don't know if there's any musical changes between Reckoning and re Reckoning, but no, no. Um, oh, okay. But they are doing a DLC for the pre re Reckoning, aren't they? They're going to bring a DLC out, so I'm guessing they'll have some music for that. Oh. Um. I'll have to take a look at that actually, because I, I actually wasn't aware they were doing DLC for Re Reckoning. Yeah, but, no, they are. Yeah, I'm not sure what what's, what it's about, but I know they're doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, and then yeah, kind of. They got one of the, sorry, they got one of the original writers from the game to, to do the, the DLC, so uh, I think it'd be good. Oh yeah. Um, jumping from the Xbox and Microsoft era, I guess, to what you do nowadays. Um, so Mario plus Rabbids, that was, I know you've mentioned in other interviews that there was a great amount of pressure for writing for a Mario game. And what was it like writing music for a Mario game for the first time? I think the pressure was, the pressure was like self-inflicted. I don't think Ubisoft, they didn't really pressure me at all. They've, they've been fantastic to me. Ubisoft Milan and Paris and David Soliani and Ramar Brio, who's the audio director, but have been super nice to me for that entire project. Um, it was just me panicking, really, thinking, you know, Koji, Koji Kondo is a legend and I'm not. And like, you know, how on earth am I going to write music for Mario game when, when someone like Koji Kondo just is brilliant at it and I'm just going to ruin it. You know, that, my kids are never going to talk to me again, you know. Um, so I was definitely panicked by doing that. Like I felt I was kind of, I was equal parts excited, equal parts panicked and scared and frightened. On that game, because um, I just thought I couldn't do it. I, I thought it's just beyond me. I'm not gonna. How can I write for Mario? Koji Kondo's a man, and I've not. You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's pretty scary that was for me anyway. You know. I I've always been told never sell yourself short. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but um, I just thought it was beyond me. And um, speaking of Mario plus Rabbids, the Phantom of the Blopra, when I first saw the trailer for Mario or Mario Plus Rabbids that had the Phantom in it, I was thinking, okay, what is going on here? <laughs> I, there's an opera singing rabbit in front of me. This game's composed by Grant Kirkle. What is happening? <laughs> yeah, like I, I was confused and I was amused at the same time. And like coming back and playing Mario Plus Rabbids through again. How did how did the Phantom of the Blopper come about? Both, so, I guess both conceptually and musically. How did it come about? So David Soliani, who's the creative director, and we're good friends these days. 
Yeah. Um, he he loved all the rare games. And he loved um, you know the um, uh, the great mighty Pooh from Conquer. And he always thought, <laughs> if I get the chance to do a game, I want to have an opera boss. I want to do it. So he got his chance when he's making Mario Rabbits. So the original idea was to have a rap, uh, sorry, a uh, opera track, a metal track, and a rap track by the same by the by the by the Phantom. So I did compose an orchestral version, and I did a, a metal version, and a, also a rap version. Um, which I think he's got still on his hard drive somewhere. They're not, they never got, never saw the light of day because he changed their minds after the, after. It was supposed to be three acts, but only managed to get two done. We'd run out of time. And so I just, so Christina Nava, who's the, one of the, uh, the sister, one of the uh, designers there, she wrote the lyrics and I wrote the music and the tune and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, it, it turned out fantastically well. I mean, it's had a gazillion views on YouTube, you know. And I think people was, <laughs> just like, I think, you know, the fact that Mario got a roasting, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, normally, normally Nintendo, you know, won't really allow, wouldn't allow that, you know, uh, and you know, so and also, you know, Mario got a, Mario got a gun in that game, and all those things that you know, I mean, Mr. Miyamoto said to Davide because you know they, got, they had to meet a few times. Said, look, take Mario and you can break him like we can't. Do things that we can't do with him. Don't try and make him like we do with him. Do something original and different, you know. So I think to Davide's credit, he came up with the idea, the whole thing, the the RTS thing, all that whole thing together, you know. Um, uh, and make him do, make, get married to do something different, give Mario guns and all that things that he did and all that, just fantastic ideas. Um, you know, so um, yeah, that, that whole, you know, he said, I'm having an opera boss and he's going to sing. I was like, all right, I'll try and do it, you know, do my best. Um, it worked out great. It was just really, a real high point of the game, I felt. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever I tell my friends about Mario plus Rabbids, I the one thing I always tell them is that we live in a day and age where Mario can get roasted by a ghost. Yeah. We, that's something we don't see. <laughs> yeah, no, it's t- I think, you know, Nintendo, you know, took the leap of faith and said, look, you, you know, you can, you can do things that we can't do with him. Go and break him. Go and, you know, that, that's what they said to Devere. I think it's a, it's a great attitude. Yeah. Um, and staying on the theme of Switch games, Smash Bros. Ultimate with Banjo's inclusion... Um, I know you had to work with, uh, with, uh, Mr. Sakurai in arranging Spiral Mountain and all that, but how were you able to keep his inclusion in Smash a secret for so long? Cause that, that must've been exciting. Oh, yeah. I know. Well, that was such a hard thing, secret to keep. I was bursting to tell people. I really was. <laughs> like, when they first contacted me, they were like very secretive in Nintendo. That's the way they are, you know, and they just sort of said, but like your assistant, like, your assistant's on a track. I was like, Oh, that was all they said. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. What is it? And I kept thinking maybe it's Banjo. I thought, no, it can't be because, you know, the, all the remixes get done by the uh, Japanese guys for Smash. Yeah. You know, and they're brilliant. And I thought, they, they don't need me to do anything. Why, I don't know why are they contacting me? They've got some great composers over there. Um, so I thought maybe I thought maybe it's some kind of Rabbids thing, maybe tie-in somewhere. I didn't think it was be Banjo. But then when, it, when they found something was Banjo, I was like, oh, my God, you know. I was so honoured <laughs> to be the, kind of the first Western guy that asked to do a, an arrangement. I think Mr. Sakurai was... Because he didn't speak English at all, he was kind of reluctant to use Western composer. I think he didn't, he didn't know how it was going to go. But um, one of the one of the Nintendo guys that Davide and the Milan guys did it with is actually Scottish, like I am. He worked at Nintendo in Japan, so he he stood in between. He did the translation between me and Sir Sakurai. So he 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 translate for me, and I translate for him. You know, so so he for me. So uh, yeah, so he, he so it went like that, and it all went great. There's, you know, they were super super nice, super respectful. Ask them to make a few changes, like they do, you know. Um, and you know, when it came to getting close to the launch, um, I was I was talking to Nintendo America, saying, you know, I'd like to be able to sort of say, you know, guess what, you know, Banjo is going to be in Smash Bros. <laughs> at the E3 announced. I said, yeah, it's fine, but look, I said, I'm going to do a little video. I said, well, all right, do a little video, send it to us, let us vet it first, let's see what you're going to say, and then and then they took they said and tweet this. I, I, I said, can you please tweet this? including these phrases or whatever it was. And I said, yeah, fine. So it was kind of like that. But he said, look, but you can't mention it until you can't see you doing it until it's up on the Smash Brothers site. Oh, so it happened at like 9.40 in the morning, I think, over here. And um, they didn't get it on the site until 11 o'clock. So I was sat on my computer watching everybody <laughs> go absolutely crazy that Banjo had been, had been included. And then on my Twitter, they're going, grand, 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 grand. <laughs> I had to sit there and, be, and couldn't reply to the. I had to, I had to sit there quiet, didn't say anything. And, just, and the fans said, "Right, you can announce it." And I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> you know, I kind of uh, got the video up there and did a little thing and all that, and it just you know went absolutely ballistic. You know, I mean, I must admit, I think 
And I met at the ETH because I went to the Nintendo booth and met the guys and sort of said, you know, they said it really was a special launch for us. Like, look, you know, a lot of the characters don't get that kind of reaction. Like, yeah, fans went absolutely. I feel, I feel like all that kind of twenty years of banjo pent upness that was that people just let it out. You know, everybody was crying. I was crying. Like, you know, <laughs> watching Gerard Khalil. You know, he's a good friend of mine. He, he, he's in tears. You know, the guys at the Nintendo store in New York, where we'd launched my rabbits. You know, we've launched it there. So other people are. You know, like everybody's in tears. Everybody's gone crazy. Like, I've never seen a reaction like that. And I, I sometimes go back and watch it. Those reactions because it's plenty of compilation videos. And I still get chills and often end up in tears like everybody else. Just like when that jiggy bounced across the screen right at the start. People yeah. like, what's that? You know, and then the duck on thing, <laughs> you know, like, and I, I mean, they told me they're going to use my piece for the trailer. I couldn't believe that. Like, I didn't expect that. They liked it so much. I look, we like it so much. We're going to lose it for the trailer. I was like, oh my God, like, not only do I get to write a piece for the game, but it's the piece in the trailer as well, which is just like amazing. So, that was one of those moments in your career, like, you know, getting to do Mario, being the first Western composer to work on Mario, and then being the first Western guy to get to Smash Brothers. Like, you know, that's just, why, why me? You know, why, why did I get to do that? Like, it's just, a, it's just one of those things I'll remember for the rest of my life that those events were so special for me. Yeah, I, I can definitely say I was one of, I was most definitely one of those people that as soon as I saw that Jiggy bounce across the screen, my eyes were locked on the screen. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I felt Correct. the goosebumps and I was like, it's happening. Yeah. It's finally, well, finally happening. <laughs> well, that was one of those events that uh, just so special. <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of Smash Bros, uh, did you supervise any of the remixes besides Spiral Mountain for Banjo's inclusion or did the other arrangers and composers have free reign? Free reign, that just gets all done separately. You kind of say, they, can, they get a little kind of PowerPoint document actually. That um, from Nintendo to sort of outline what they want you to do. I guess I must give it to all, all the Smash composers, but it sort of says don't contact any other composers. So oh. um, I'm not that I wouldn't know how to contact them anyway, but I, I had no insight into that at all. I mean, the, all the remixes that they did are so good, like way better than I could do. Um, so I think they did an amazing job. I think so too. The one, the one I always come back to because it's my, it's actually my favorite track from Banjo's Treasure Trove Cove, the right. one that uh, Yoko Shimomura did. Yeah, she's great. She's a great, she's a great composer. Just whenever I go to Spiral Mountain, I pick that one because it's so good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a pretty brilliant job. They're all fantastic. Yeah. And uh, kind of steering away from Smash Bros, just to kind of coming back to a more general sense of things. Uh, looking, kind of looking back on your career, whether it's from the N64 era or uh, Xbox or whatever. Is there, if there was, eh, how do I want to word this? Um, is there a song that you consider to be like your magnum opus? It's like front page of your resume. This is what I do. Like, is there a piece that comes to mind for you on that? <laughs> That's a hard one. I get asked that quite a lot. And I, my mind sort of changes from time to time. Like I wrote a piece for uh, Civilization Beyond Earth called Fractal Aquion which is this big, giant, epic orchestral thing. And I really like that, you know, that's one of my favorite pieces I've ever written. But, you know, people often don't listen to that stuff. It's funny, because, like, um, I've claimed my profile on Spotify now. When you're an artist, you can claim your profile, so you get an insight, you can see what people are playing on your profile, what pieces are getting played most often. Yeah. It's funny, it's been really useful to me, because the pieces that I thought weren't that great are the ones that everyone loves, and the ones that I love are the people that no one, <laughs> no one likes. So it's, it's, it's funny how, like, it just shows you, as a composer, you don't really know what's good, what appeals to people. You just don't, you, things you, that I really rate, other people don't. So, top of my playlist usually on on so my, on my my stuff on Spotify is usually number one is always Mid Boss Mayhem from My Rabbits because that's a very Banjo Kazooie sounding piece. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's always at the top of my. When I did, I did the World of Warcraft Shadow, Shadowlands yes last year, so they're sort of the top ones at the moment. But the first one after those is always mid boss me and also a piece called Dalantarth from Kings of Amalur, which is like one that one I wouldn't have picked out as being particularly great. You know, it's funny how people, but it's, it's been really useful to me, you know, when I go pitching, pitching for jobs that I know the pieces that I probably pick are the wrong ones. It's probably, you know, uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. So I guess I like Fractal Aquí and I like Bedtime Story from View Pinata 2. Uh, that's really a really sad piece. I kind of wrote that, I was just about to leave Rare super sad it kind of as my emotions were in that piece and you know, it makes me cry yeah um so um 
I mean, Boss Mayan from Rabbids is great because it's a real banjo kazooie thing, you know, it sounds you know, like that. The, the fact that Bop is a great piece as well. Um, Man Muscle Man from Banjo kazooie like that a lot. The Chicago Stealth from Perfect Dark, I love that one. Um, you know, it's just each day is different, right? You know, but as I say, it's funny how the pieces that I really rate don't rate that highly in my what people are playing on Spotify, man, which is weird. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of the same way whenever, like, whenever I open up the albums I have on my phone, I'm like, okay, I, w- I want to listen to something. I'm always in the mood for, there's always that one specific song that I want to like listen to rearrangements of, or it's just like the same thing, but it sounds a bit different. Right. It's, it's, I forgot what I was going to say, but <laughs> that's, that's oh. kind of. It's kind of the way I think of the way I think. Oh, about I totally it get that. Sense. And also, there's so many great remixes out there. But everyone's lots of our, lots of my pieces, lots of composers' pieces, and it's great to hear them do it in a different way. You know, um, there's just been that Banjo Kazooie Scar album came out a couple of a, few, a couple of months ago, which is all all the Banjo Kazooie pieces done in a in a Scar fashion uh, yeah. style. It's, it's just brilliant, you know. And people are so inventive. It's like. I love hearing people remix my stuff. It just it opened my eyes to like, you know, God, I didn't think of that, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. Yeah, um, I've actually been meaning to listen to that Scott album. I'll have to get my hands on it here soon. Yeah, it's great, really good. Yeah, um, kind of on the on the flip side of the spectrum, um, is there a song looking back on your career again? Is there one that you would go back and improve upon if given the chance? You know what? I'm not good at that. Like, so, like, I'm not a great polisher. I've always said that. Um, so, um, I don't think I'd, I'd, I'd leave everything as it is. I really would. So, I probably just go back and make it completely worse. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, but so I have actually, I've, I've been talking about this for like for years, it seems, but I've actually started <laughs> my own Banter Kazooie remix album. I'm kind of halfway through it, but I'm really not enjoying doing it. I just don't like going back to my own music and redoing it. I just, it's like pulling teeth. I just, I just find it hard. So as I'm halfway through, but I'm doing it, it's so slow. I'll get there in the end and I'll, I'll stick it out, I guess, when I finally finish it. If I, ever, I will at some point, God knows when that'll be. So <laughs> Yeah, like I'm just not great at doing that. If I went back and changed something, I think I'd just make it worse. I just, I've kind of, I'm kind of like done it. It's finished. That's it. I'm on to the next thing. Um, I'm not, I'm not good at doing that. I, I've actually seen you mention that a few times on Twitter, at least with, I think it was with Mad Monster Mansion you showed off a few times. Yeah, I've showed a few. I've showed like 20 seconds of a few of them. There's a few videos on my, on my Twitter page of like four or five of the pieces. Um, so I've done like uh, six or seven now, I think something like that. Um, I'm just slow in getting around to, around to it. And that and that doesn't um, today's circumstances don't really help with that either. You know, with COVID and that actually kind of segues into my my next question, um, the the ever pressing question: How has COVID or the pandemic impacted your career and your job nowadays? Not, actually, not at all. It's funny enough. Like I think I think us composers. I've got away scot-free really like because you know I sit in this, in this room writing music and it hasn't changed like even working on World of Warcraft last year doing um uh, the Shadowlands stuff um the whole company had to transition from being up to go to working from home you know so it took them a little while to get it right but once they got started it was just like back to normal you know so I guess you know people are still I sat at home playing games I don't think it's really affected the games industry apart from the fact people have had to, companies have had to transition to working from home that's been a bit of a you know for the big companies it's been quite hard but um, really hasn't affected me at all. Like my life just revolves around, you know, taking the kids to school. My, my son's old and I drive myself now. Picking the kids up from school at some point, getting the groceries. That's all right. That's what, all I ever really do anyway. And then work, you know, and I write music. So um, my life really hasn't changed apart from the fact I wasn't going to get the kids from school. I was still getting the groceries and writing music. My wife's teaching from home. She's a teacher. My, my kids were learning at home because they're, they're, you know, they're both at school. Um, so my life didn't change very much at all, part of the fact that this didn't go out, you know. I've had the first vaccine shot. My wife, my wife's had both vaccine shots because she, she had a teacher, she got them early. My son's had the first vaccine shot. I get my second shot in a week. So I'll be complete, I'm, I'm, not, I'm 80% covered now, but I'll be fully covered in, in a week's time or so. So um, it hasn't really affected me really, apart from me just didn't go out. I gotcha. Um, I actually got my first COVID shot not too long ago. My pharmacy here in town just 
just had them just started having them available which is yeah. fantastic yeah definitely I, I, I really find that you know i thought i was elated when i got my first shot like it's two weeks ago now you know like it's you just think that modern science thing where they got a vaccine done in a year is just absolutely incredible like those people people are so unbelievably brilliant um they've saved gazillions of lives and there's no doubt about it you know amazing yeah um It's kind of, kind of an obvious question, but I guess really the only difference between then and now is that you, you don't really get the chance to get with those conductors and with like the live orchestra stuff anymore. I know, because on World of Warcraft, we were due to go to uh, Skywalker Ranch up in, you know, up in San Francisco, you know, up there, uh, which would be amazing to go there to record. And it was all booked. It was booked last March. Uh, and um, just as COVID hit, it got cancelled immediately. Because mm. even though we we're going to go in private jets, even to get up there, you know, the small little planes, um, to not be in a big, we just couldn't do it. So we ended up recording it in Australia, but remotely. So we were all online on computer, watching these guys play in Australia because Australia didn't get didn't get hit by the vaccine because they sorry by the virus because they kept the borders closed and all that. Mm. So um, yeah, it's a shame. We still recorded it live, but it was done remotely. We didn't get to go. Huh. Um. I think that's actually all of the questions that I that I have written down here, at least. Um, do you have any questions for me? Not really. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one one more thing before we before we end off here. Do you think you could do a bit of mumbo jumbo for me? <laughs> well, mumbo jumbo is me, my voice, but you, you pitch it down right. So yeah. it, a normal my, my voice at a normal pitch, and I, I took it. I just pitched it down. Mm -hmm. So if, if, it, if it, you'd have to slow it down and, and so it sound right. Yeah. So I thought, God, what I've, I've got? If we think God, I'll eat up. Ah. <laughs> if you slow that down, it should sound just like mumbo. I'll I'll probably pitch it down a bit during during editing to make sure it sounds right. But yeah, it should be about right. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for being here with me grant i appreciate it very much no it's, it's nice to be asked thanks for asking me yeah no problem oh and thanks for the uh the signatures too i i just gotta find a place to put them up on my wall <laughs> no I, I do get asked to sign stuff from time to time so I, I try to do my best yeah um that's all i have so um unless you have anything else for me uh that's about it no, it's all good here. Have a good day, sir. And I shall uh, if you want to talk to me again. Let me know. All right. Sounds good. All, all right. right. Talk all to right. you later. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>